So first of all, I saw you you played in the Rochester uh, Lancers, which is the same team in which is playing now seven MRC Michael Lewis Cunningham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael Cunningham. I love that guy. Yeah. Uh, have you ever played against him? I've played against him and with him. We played uh, we played together on the same team um, for uh, just some men's men's league team uh, when I when we both lived in Rochester. And then uh, last season and the season before I played against him. Okay. And how is it like? Very talented player. Very, yeah. very talented player. <laughs> and really nice guy. Um, so yeah, he's definitely definitely the real deal. Okay, yeah, yeah totally. And uh, I saw he done a lot of he's done a lot of extras like uh, as a mobility standpoint, yoga, gym training. And how do you prepare yourself during the season and off season? Like, what kind of training do you do? Yeah, so that's that's a really complex question, but um, it's and the the big message that I have to young players who are trying to play at the next level is to make sure that you're doing more than just soccer training. You, you need strength training. You need flexibility training. You need mental preparation. You need to spend time doing visualization. Um, there's a lot of elements to, to training, to being a professional athlete, other than just having a ball at your foot. You should have a ball on your foot for a lot of, for a lot of the training. That's a very, very big part of it. Um, but for me, especially, I found my success in all of the other elements um, of training myself. And so now, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I, I micromanage my own training regimen very, very specifically based on where I'm at in the season, how many games we have coming up, who the opponent might be, um, anything like that. But yeah, I like to, uh, you know, mostly, I guess the, the, the best, um, best way to, to explain it so a lot of my strength and um muscle muscle gains and all that happens during the off season okay. and then in season is mostly just soccer flexibility a little bit of strength training just to maintain balance in the muscles um, but that's you know most of the work for the body the preparation is done during the off season okay yeah I've got few questions about strength training because I saw on internet, for instance, that footballers or, or overall athletes should squat twice the, their body weight. But at the moment, for me, it's kind of impossible because I weigh seven. I don't know in uh, in your uh, measurement, but it's seventy six kg, and I can squat ninety uh, five kg maximum. So squatting like one hundred and fifty, it's a long, long way, and uh, like doing that lift uh, more than twice that your body weight, uh, those uh, standards. What's your standards for you and for the teammates that uh, do strength session as you do? Um, we don't really have too much specific. There's, there's nothing really like they do like us to be able to squat and deadlift twice our weight. Um, But other than that, there's nothing really specific that they have us go for. Personally, um, I like to take the other major lifts as well, the, the bench press, the row, the squat, and the deadlift. Um, and I like to get two times my, my body weight. Um, and then I like to make them um, uh, more like athletically relevant. So jumping squats and jumping push-ups and uh, things like that. But basically, yeah, it's it's you, yeah, you you hit the number on the head twice the body weight. And the reason is because whenever you run, so for me, it, it's weird because I don't know the conversion either, but I weigh I weigh 185 pounds. And so when I run, my body, because of the force of gravity and the, the, the force of just having the excess pressure, my body recognizes it as 370 pounds. So it recognizes it at twice the body weight. So the reason to lift heavier. Um, is because when you're running now, because of the extra pressure on the joints from, from gravity and from force and speed and velocity and all that stuff, um, that the body needs to be prepared for more than just your body weight. Okay. Is that full squat or half squat, like more sports specific? I'm sorry? Uh, do you do like twice your body weight in a full squat or just half squat or a quarter squat, more uh, sports specific? 
Uh, I try to do full squat. Okay. Okay. Yeah, full squat, low squat, ass, ass to grass. Oh, that's tough. That's really tough, honestly. Uh, what's your What's your opinion on uh, trap bar deadlift? Because I follow many strength and conditioning coach, and they are saying that like every athlete should be doing trap bar deadlift. And when the gym were opened, like few months ago, uh, I tried it and it was great because it seems like uh, really specific for me at least. Yeah, I love the trap bar deadlifts. Um, they're great for athletes because they require a lot more than, than the muscles in the front and the back of the leg. They also require a lot from the muscles on the sides of the leg, which are very important for soccer players and any athlete who moves sideways. So yeah, I, I, I love hex bar deadlifts and I think that they should be used so I train deadlifts twice a week okay. and I'll do regular bar deadlifts one day and then hex bar or trap tra bar deadlifts the other day. Okay. 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 Got it. So I was thinking also, you told, you told about the mental side of the game, visualization and stuff like that. I'm trying to do visualization, meditation, mindfulness, all this stuff, but especially visualization, I tend to do it. Uh, Either I don't do it, like for a week I don't do it, or I do too much, like three times per day. Did you find a balance during uh, during your uh, your career? Like what's best for you and why? Yeah, so um, I've found, for me, I found like what I like to visualize. And, and, and at this point in my career, I know most of the situation, because when you visualize, there's a couple of different things that I'll visualize. One is I'll visualize my life. Well, I'll visualize soccer. So in the next game, so whatever opponent that I'm playing in, I'll visualize my roles and responsibilities. And especially as a defender, um, there's certain situations and plays that will happen every single game. And so, I'll, you know, for an example, a 2v1, two versus one, there will always be at least one 2v1 that I'll face every single game. And so I always picture myself defending, you know, close my eyes and 20 times I picture them coming from midfield in a 2v1 and what I would do and me winning the ball, me cutting the angle, me winning the ball, and then me passing the ball to distribute and starting the counterattack. Um, so I'll just do that play 20 times and then, For another example, uh, in the offensive half of the field, as a defender, I'll get the ball in a very specific place, and I'll either be able to cut left or cut right based on where the rest of the, the defensive balance is. And so I'll envision myself 20 times cutting to the right and taking a shot. And then I'll envision myself 20 times cutting to the left and taking a shot. Um, and so as I've gotten older and in my career, and uh, I find the situations that I'm in very, very regularly, That's what I've started to base my, my visualization on. Um, and then the other big part of it is I, got, I visualize on my future life. So where I want to be in 10 years, 15 years, not necessarily where I want to be, but maybe things that I want to have, a certain house, a certain car, talking in front of big groups of people, um, being in a big soccer stadium or arena, um, little things like that. So, yeah, so I'll do my soccer visualization before training. Okay. Because I like to do like uh, before training, I like to get in the hot tub and stretch and do mobility work and stuff. So I'll generally do my visualization then. And then my visualization for life, I'll do that in the morning as a part of my morning routine. Um, and each one, each one takes about five to 10 minutes. Okay. And what about individual training? Because for example, tomorrow morning, I'm going to do like ball mastery session, kind of uh, Michael Lewis Cunningham, a YouTube video and juggling. And in those situations, what would you do? Like visualizing that training or still visualizing like a game that I would have in a week or two? Uh, well, the, the drills that I'm doing are hopefully for to, to make me sharpen up for a game. So I don't know, I guess, I don't know. I guess earlier in my career, I probably would have visualized doing the moves. I would have visualized my training session and executing in the training session. Okay. So that's a good question because yeah, I definitely because especially when I was learning different skills and you know, creating some of the different drills that I've created, a lot of the visualization was around, all right, how do I want to do this? And how do I want to and then I would stop right before the, like right before I did the drill, I would close my eyes, execute myself doing it well, and then uh open my eyes and do the drill. Okay, okay. And 
I'm I used to do only kind of only it was like a minimalistic training that I was doing uh, uh, recently, like only footwork and juggling hours of juggling hours of footwork because I was like convinced that if my juggling were, ability were uh, amazing, I would be an amazing football player. But then I understood that in the game there are so many different situations that you have to train them specifically. And uh, in your experience, do you, in your individual training, do you spend most of the time doing uh, like the basics or doing situation, situational training, like uh, reproduce situation during the game and uh, doing them uh, over and over and over? Half and half. I'll generally spend the, the beginning part of a training. So my, my personal training sessions are like, I'll do like 10 minutes of speed and agility work, and then I'll do 10 minutes of ball work, ball mastery. Um, and then for 10 minutes, I'll make it into a little bit bigger of a ball mastery, like dribbling in space. Um, and then for to end the sessions, it'll always be game application. So taking whatever drill or whatever move and putting it into a, a game type of situation. Okay. I've got a... Uh... A twin who is a goalkeeper, so I always use them as a as a partner to train. But as a defender, I used to do. I'm using. I I mean, I divide my training in two types of uh, drills: defensive side and offensive. In the offensive side, I either I do long passing, like I have to switch the play to the I don't know striker or right wing as a left back or. Uh, my brother is passing the ball to me as if he was a center back and I have to open my hips and uh, and go go on, uh, on the channel let's say yeah, yeah yeah on the defensive side I used to do I'm using to do um, heading specific heading or sliding tackle what would you do like what do you do actually in your training uh I mean there's a balance of everything it's, I mean, I, ha I have a, I have a, a book of drills that I, that I balance between, but man, it's, it's literally everything. Like you said, like some days, some days it'll be headers. Some days it'll be slide tackling. Sometimes it'll be dribbling up the channels, um, distribution, things like that. Um, yeah, most of, I mean, heading drills involves a lot of like jumping over cones and trying to jump in the air. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's, I just have, I just have specific drills for each, Okay. I mean, so, you know, uh, have you ever played FIFA, like the video game yes, FIFA? Yes. And you know how there's like training, you know how there's training yeah, drills yeah, for like yeah. every single skill pretty much? That, yeah. That's how I've tried to do things as I've gotten older. I have, a, I have like my sets, my set drills for, for heading, my set drills for dribbling, my set drills for okay. um, working footwork for defending. And I'll just rotate between those very regularly. Okay. It's like a muscle. You train, I don't know. A squat, uh, deadlift, uh, some, like twice a week, and you try you try to train all those abilities at least once a week, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, M much like you would have, like a like in the gym, you, you have a leg day, you have an arm, you know, a chest day, you have a back day, um, and that's the same thing in training. Like some days you'll have a dribbling day, some days you'll have a shooting day, some days you'll have a heading, you know, heading and defending day. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also saw that you are a SAQ specialist, a speed, agility, quickness specialist. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. So as I've gotten older, um, I got in, <clears throat> I had an injury about eight years ago and coming back from that, I wanted to learn how to make myself quicker and faster and stronger. Um, so I took a couple of uh, education classes in speed and agility um, and then a bunch of different athletic training style classes. So um, I've become very, very passionate about that over the last 10 years, just because <clears throat> train, doing those type of drills changed my game completely. Um, just once I, once my body was actually strong and fast and quick and agile. <clears throat> so, so now I like sharing all that stuff. That's why you see on my page, I try to put out at least one drill every single week um, or one set of drills <clears throat> that players can emulate. Yeah. I saw you use a lot the ladder like sprint ladder. Uh, I saw some videos, for instance, Become Elite, Matt Sheldon, I guess you know him. And yep. uh, he did a video like two years ago in the in which he was saying basically, uh, the ladder is great for agility and uh, food, footwork, but it's not like game realistic. So he was basically saying, don't, don't expect to be great on ladders 
and uh, be like uh, fast and uh, the fastest player in the pitch. What's your opinion about that? Yeah, that's absolutely true. The, the ladder is just a tool to then make you faster on, on the field. Um, you know, if you think about the, if you think about a ladder, it has 10 boxes. <clears throat> so it's an opportunity <clears throat> for you. Excuse me, let me take it. I know what I said. So when you go through the ladder, that's an opportunity for you to take 10 repetitions of a certain movement. I like to do one foot jumping in the ladder, especially because it's a, it's a good opportunity to take 10 quick jumps or 20 quick jumps, depending on what drill it is. Um, uh, so once your body, you know, once you can get good and proficient at that movement in the ladder, <clears throat> not only from a, from a mental standpoint, like the, the, the mind needs to teach the body how to move. Plus the, the muscles have to be strong enough to move that way. Plus the joints have to be stable enough to be stable in, the, in different positions. Um, and so once you can do that effectively and efficiently in a ladder, then you can go into a drill, into a, uh, into the field and actually do like a more game realistic drill. Okay. Okay. And do you do also five, 10, five, uh, I, I don't watch NFL, but I watch the NFL draft. And so they always do five yards, 10 yards, and then five yards. And I think personally, this is really soccer specific in a way because there is change of direction and in, in soccer it happens a lot so do you do that as well yeah i do that and i like to do it with the ball and without the ball okay okay and it's actually if you go back far enough on my page you'll see that i may i put out a video oh probably five six months ago where i did uh there's the, the five ten five and then you can make that also into a t so if you add another cone back now you got to go forward, figure eight around the cones, and then back with back. Um, and so I put out, yeah, both with the ball and then without the ball. Okay. And do you time yourself? Do you have like a timer in which basically you understand, okay, I did these in, I don't know, five seconds. Next time I'd like to do these in 4.99. Um, I do like to do that um, with, especially when I'm measuring. Um, but if I'm in just like a regular workout mode, um, I'll, I'll just try to go as hard as I possibly can. It won't be, I won't be timing myself every single repetition. Oh, okay. um, I'll do it time myself in week one and then in week three and then week five, just to make sure that I'm getting uh, progressively better. Okay. Okay. And uh, you were saying you, uh, you have been a professional for eight years and you are now 32, if I'm 30. 34. So you basically uh, became professional at 20, 26, 25, 26. Correct. I mean, um, if if in Italy, because I grew up in Italy and now I'm in UK, if in Italy you are not uh, in a pro team when you are like 16, everyone thinks, okay, you are done, you have to find the real job or something. Instead, they watch like Big Camerit videos, Sheldon Tweedy's video, and it's kind of normal if in a 22, 23, you are not pro, you want to be pro, it's it's a normal thing to, to do, actually. Yeah, it's, um, and honestly, here in the States too, it's very, very, very difficult to get a professional contract after about 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, because we've grown into a very similar status to other countries where we have each pro team has their own academy. And so the pro teams are looking at players through their young academy. And if you're not in an academy, it's hard to get a look. And if you're not excelling in that academy, then you probably won't be professional. Um, so for me, it was and I still had a lot of coaches telling me, look, you're, you're not you don't have a contract. You need to start thinking about plan B in life. You need to figure something else out. Um, but for me, I, I, I knew I could do it. And so I kept training harder and I kept figuring out how I could make myself better and what I could do better. And so, yeah, to get a professional contract at 26 years old, um, is almost unheard of, um, yeah. even in the U S so, um, it was, but it just goes to, it just goes to show that if you just keep working and keep working and keep putting in the work and have discipline and, and keep making yourself better, um, and that's a big thing. Like a lot of players are just like, oh, I, I work hard, I work hard, I work, work, work. And it's, well, how are you making yourself better? Like, don't just train, get better. Like, don't, and don't just get better as a soccer player, get better as an athlete, 
learn to eat better, visualize better, mm -hmm. sleep better, like everything, you know, everything, everything can always be sharpened up a little bit. Um, and it's all those little, little details that are, that are going to do it. Well, we had an, uh, an inspiration. Honestly, you should produce content, in my opinion, about it, because I didn't think it was possible to become professional at 26 and up until uh, two years ago. I was thinking, okay, I'm 20, it's going to be difficult to be a professional. Then I saw many other people became professional at 22, 23, so I thought, okay, I still have a chance, but 26 is amazing, I mean. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I will. I'm, I'm going to have a YouTube channel at some point. I'm going to take all this content, uh, the content that I've created on Instagram and start moving over to the YouTube channel very soon. Yeah. I'm going to have to take a page from Michael Lewis, uh, his his uh, page, because he's he's done great on YouTube. How many subscribers did he have? Does he have like 300,000? 300,000, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So if you do a collaboration with him, you're going to start at least from uh, 10k subscribers i guess yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, even because in football it's not like i don't know a 100 meters sprinter that they, they had to do only that stuff in football there is the technical side which is offensive side defensive you have to do you have to be good at first touch passing ball mastery long passing short passing a lot of abilities then there is the physical part which is strength rapidity agility explosivity and the mental side so i was thinking if you only improve like by one percent in all this part in one year if you do that for five years you are a completely different player so even though you are like 27 at 32 maybe you are in, you are in another level completely yeah, you're absolutely right. And that I've been able to testify from that both from a non-professional and a professional side, because, you know, I, I went from, you know, getting my, my pro contract so late to um, four years after that, I got the, I got named the best defender, so. the defender of the year. So the best defender in the league. And so what I saw was that taking that mentality of trying to find little ways to make myself better every single day, like that, that got me to my pro contract. And then once I was in the arena, having that same mentality, like, I, like not having the mentality of the complacency of, of thinking, oh, I made it, I'm good, but no, I can still be 1% better. I can still eat 1% better. I can still sleep 1% better. Um, having that constant mentality every day took me even to the, the next level of my career personally. And so, um, yeah, even, you know, in the pursuit of the pro contract, and then even once you get the pro contract, having that type of vision and that type of discipline and mentality this is what's going to separate you from all the other hundreds of thousands of you know, players that are trying to, to make it you know yeah. and have you ever thought of giving up when you were 24 25 and maybe someone close to you was told you like robert you got to find a plan b yeah there was a couple times um especially because I did a lot of tryouts between the ages of 21 and 24 and tryouts here, they cost money. And so it costs money to travel to them, to do the tryout. I had to miss work to go to them. And so time after time, it was like, I would spend hundreds of dollars to go to a tryout. I would do really well. And then, you know, not get, not get selected. And that just kept happening, kept happening, kept happening. And I was broke and I was, in a, I was, I was putting a lot of stress on the relationship that I was in. And, um, you know, there was just a lot of things that were going wrong. And so it's, you know, a couple of times it was like, is this, you know, is this the route that I should continue to pursue? And, um, but for me, that's where, um, I I'm also, I'm a Christian. And so I have, I have a very strong relationship with God. So I've spent a lot of time praying about it, meditating on that. And the answer that I always got was keep going. It was, it was always, always keep going. Whenever I put everything aside, closed my eyes, and tuned everything out, always heard keep going. And so, um, so yeah, so that's what, <clears throat> that's what kind of helped push me through some of those dark times where it was like, all right, am I going to keep doing this or not? Wow. Wow. I saw a post of Salah, Mohamed Salah, not in his profile, someone else profile in which he was saying uh, when he was uh, like 16, 17, he used to sit three times per week, thinking about his career, uh, how much work he did, uh, how can like improve to be a 
top professional footballers and after 10 years he became like one of the top elite professional footballers so i think this part like even uh, sitting alone in a room and thinking about okay what should i do should i what's your my why like they used to say find your way no find your why and find your way something like that like that yeah and uh, about saq what's your opinion on jumping rope because i had a conversation a week ago with a jump rope coach it's called the jump rope coach chris on instagram he is amazing and uh, he told me there are many competitions about freestyle and speed and they saw the speed competitions uh, and i thought if i'm able to have not the speed, but even half of the speed that they have in those competitions, I would be the quickest player on the pitch if I do extras. Have you ever incorporated jumping rope on your uh, routine? Yeah, I've done a lot. I've jumped a lot of rope over the years. I love jumping rope. Okay. Um, sometimes I'll use it for different. Sometimes I'll use it for a warm up. Uh, sometimes I'll actually use it for the workout. Sometimes I'll use it for cardio. Um, but it's a great way to, again, kind of like we talked about with the, with the ladder, it's a good way to get repetitions on each leg, a lot of repetitions in a small space. So jumping rope isn't necessary. Jumping rope in itself isn't going, isn't going to make you faster, but getting really good at jumping rope builds the muscle in your calves and in your quads. It trains the tendons and the ligaments to be more explosive. And it trains your brain to move those legs quicker, especially if you can do more complex patterns or jump faster. So if your muscles, your joints, your ligaments, tendons, and your brain can do all that while jumping rope, then you can take it and do it and, and apply it to soccer. Then do more specific soccer drills, more specific running drills, um, footwork drills for defenders, things like that. Um, and having all those things that you gain from jumping rope will make you better in these other areas too. Okay. Are you able to do double unders? Double unders? Yeah. That was a tough one. It took okay. me a while to get there. <laughs> because I'm trying so hard to uh, to do the single legs double unders. It's impossible. It's I mean, it's not impossible, but it would take me months. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. I, I even wore a weight vest while I was jumping rope for a while. Um, and I found that that helped me uh, with... Uh, that helped me get to the double unders quicker. Okay. I I also thought about uh, using a vest, but I was thinking that maybe it would be, it would put too much stress on my joints and ligaments. I don't know. Maybe it's my bias. Um, yeah, it would be. So you don't want to do it too much, but it's, it's good. It's just like, if you think about um, putting a weight on your back for doing squats, it's okay. the same, same thing. So as long as it's secured on your back and it's not like, like bouncing up and down on your back um, and, it's, and it's secured tightly, it's good. It, it'll, it'll even help you engage your core more. So you'll have to squeeze your core and engage that more, which will make you stronger and faster okay. also. I'll try it, I'll try it. And yeah, about core, just today I, I did a post on Instagram in which I was talking about a core exercise that no one does, uh, almost no one, which is the single leg, a uh, single arm dumbbell farmer walk sure for me the, that one is one of the great ex ex exercise that i can do after i do the, that exercise i feel like so much stronger that if i have a tackle with lukaku or or someone that big i would <laughs> win that tackle <laughs> <laughs> um you nailed it though a lot that's very even when people do farmer's walks most of the time they'll do the double arm farmer's walk. So rarely do people do the single arm farmer's walk. So that's a good, that's definitely a good one. Good. You're doing that. Yeah. Have you ever done that? Or do you do usually? Yeah. I use dumbbells and actually a couple of years ago, I used an actual barbell for a while for those. Um, I read somewhere that using a barbell for, uh, I used it for the farmer's walk, the carries farmer's walk and for lunges. Um, I would hold it on one side. And just having the, the massive weight displacement was more of a core activator as yeah. well. And do you train your core specifically? Because I've read like many footballers, not, not professional, but like semi-pro, and they are saying, uh, if you do squats, that lift and bench press, you're okay. The core is engaged. In my opinion, the core has so many functions like anti-rotation, anti-expansion, anti-flexion. 
that you have to train it specifically, while others think it's a waste of time and energy. You have to work on some other areas on your body. What's your opinion about that? You, you nailed it. Um, a lot of those guys don't really understand the physics of the body and what exactly the core is doing in athletic situations. Um, the, uh, hang on a second. I want to move out here real quick. Um, I'm going to just come to a quieter room. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Um, yeah, so they, so they're just looking at like muscle mass and muscle mass is that's, that's one thing. And that can, that can definitely be obtained just if you're squatting and, uh, deadlifting and bench pressing, um, the, the muscle is going to grow, it's going to get stronger, but as far as what it's doing in athletics, the anti-rotation, um, the stability through single leg movements through, through changing direction, um, a lot of that stuff needs like more specific core type of drills, yeah. core type of training. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. So I'm not the only one thinking about core specifically. <laughs> and yeah. uh, about the mindset, sorry if I'm twitching from one topic to another, but if something pops in my mind, I'm gonna exp I'm gonna talk about this topic. About the mindset, do you read or listen to any podcasts or do you read any books that for you are really important? Like my favorite one is this one, David Goggins. Maybe you, you know him. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah, I love David Goggins. Oh, okay. He's, so what what would you recommend to read? Yeah, so my so reading, um, man, there's I try to read 10 pages every single day. And uh I you know, I could I can send you a list of my my favorite books. One of them is uh my my favorite book of all time is is the uh Oh, now I'm freaking blanking on it. It's the seven, the, or no, no, it's the laws of success, the laws of success. Um, and it was written in like 1900, like 1920s. Um, but it was based on some big, you know, big business entrepreneurs back then. And the principles that they discuss um, are all about like self-discipline and critical thinking um, and things that apply to, to life, you know, on and off the pitch. Um, but that was my favorite book of all time, the law of success. Um, and then start with why by Simon Sinek. Um, that's a really good one. Um, yeah, the David Goggins books, those are good. Um, and then I also like to listen to podcasts and my two favorite podcasts. Um, one of them is by this, this guy's name is Andy Frisella. And I don't know if you saw on my page, uh, I just got named as a sponsored athlete for a company called first form. And he's the CEO of this company. And for the last six years, he's been putting out a free podcast where he talks about what it took to build a business from, from ground zero, no money, no anything to now first form is worth uh, close to a billion dollars. And um, so he talks about, you know, he puts out a podcast two or three times a week talking about certain things, mentality or lifestyle or habits, um, things like that. And so and for four years in a row, uh, it was the number one podcast in the world in business and in entrepreneurship, if that tells you like how good it is. Um, so and it's free, like he doesn't run any advertisements on it. He doesn't charge for it. Like it's it's crazy how he's done it. And he grew it to be like that. That in itself taught me a lesson. He's like, you know, give for free, give for free, give for free. And sure enough, like it, it, it's one of the most successful podcasts. Um, so his name is Andy Frisella and the podcast is called the MF CEO podcast. Um, he has another one now called the real AF show. Um, but the MF CEO podcast is what is what put me onto him. Um, and then, uh, the other big podcasts, I oh, there's two other ones that I listen to. One is the Ed Milet show. Um, Ed Milet is yes. another big, have you heard of him? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I did love to have my let show that's a great great podcast he's a great guy um and then last but and then i also listened to the joe rogan podcast oh because, yeah okay. yeah that that's just good for perspective man he has so many different guests that it's like you can learn something from an astrophysicist one day and then learn something from a fitness guru the next day you know? yes i listen sometimes to joe rogan there is a guy in, in italy that basically does pretty much the same interview everyone so 
I, I love those kind of podcasts in which you like the host and the, and the structure of like questions and everything. And then you keep like uh, getting content on different topics. I love that. Yeah. Uh, what about Gary V? Because for me, Gary V is, is the best. Yeah, I like Gary Vee a lot. For for some reason, I just never quite got on to like listening to his podcast. Maybe I should, maybe this is my push to actually listen to his, to his content more. But I love his messages. I follow him on I follow him on Instagram and I make sure I check out his stuff pretty regularly just to give myself that dose of, of success you, and gratitude and happiness and everything that he promotes. And uh, talking instead about football, the mental side, because uh, I was thinking the last months uh, in which basically you we don't have any game to reproduce my defensive training uh, uh, do you reproduce my defensive style of, of uh, in the game on the training but for me it's almost impossible because i want to listen to your experience and uh, your mindset when i play as a defender and the others have got the ball i use i'm using to uh, to see like the eyes of who has the ball especially if I'm far from the wall, because you can tell from the eyes if someone is doing like a passing on their feet or on the space, and then I can anticipate maybe the right wing or the striker. So what do you look at? The feet, the eyes, everything you like to read the game in general? Yeah, it's a combination of the, the, uh, the eyes and the hips eyes and the hips and the hips lie sometimes because you know players are pretty shifty but the eyes a lot of times especially if you're watching like one to two seconds ahead you'll see players scanning the field and you'll see you know especially if you can like see like scan where they're scanning and see you know kind of know what they'd be looking for like for example as a defender if i see like their their right midfielder creeping up and i see like a second before that i see their center midfielder scanning and and he sees it then I know when he turns that he's already got that in his mind. And that's probably going to be where he tries to distribute. Um, even if he can, especially even if he continues to look forward, um, a lot of players have a tell is if, if, if they're dribbling forward, their, their eyes will be forward. If they're obviously, if they're passing to the right, their, their, their eyes will be the right. But if they're going to try to shift you, if they're going to try to be sneaky about it, their eyes will be just off center. So they're not quite looking at you. They're kind of looking into that space right to the right of you just to open up like the peripherals. At least, like at least in my experience, most of the studies that I play, uh, most of the players that I play against, um, that's their tell. Is they won't like when they're when they're going to try to take me one on one, or they're going to try to cut in. Um, they'll be looking directly at that path. But if they are even thinking about a little move and a, and a no look pass to the right, um, they'll be that little. They'll be looking just slightly to the right, just slightly off center. So yeah, so the the eyes will tell a lot, and then obviously the hips will tell a lot too. Uh, that's that's a great tip. Yeah. And what about one on one? Because I try different like mentality. I try, of course, you got to watch the ball and the feet. But are you like active? You push them on the side, or you are kind of passive and thinking, okay, as soon as you move the ball, I'm gonna react. Uh, what's your mindset? How do you face a one on one? Uh, it depends on who I'm uh, facing it against. Um, and that's funny because earlier in my career, it would have been, you know, you, you approach it one way, but now I know the players well enough that certain players I'll give a little bit more space um, because they're, they're quicker than me. Um, but then other players, I know that if, if I jam them up, if I get in their face early, then they're uncomfortable and they don't like that. If they, if they have a second or two to set their feet and get going, then they're dangerous. But if they receive the ball and I can get straight into them um, within, you know, before that two second mark, um, I have a lot higher percent of chance of winning, um, but you know, vice versa. I know there's some really cheeky and crafty players who, if I take that quick step up, <clears throat> they're gonna find a way to poke it around me or do you know do something. And so I I know that I have to take a step back, slow it down a little bit, um, and get my balance. Okay. And then even if I'm in those positions, in, in those type of one on ones, then I like to play cat and mouse. So I'll do like a little dance with them. So I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll jockey a little bit. I'll come back for a couple steps or two, but then I'll lunge forward. Like I'm going to, you know, win the ball. And then it's just that, that little cat and mouse game. So sometimes I'll lunge forward and then come through with the opposite foot or I'll, you know, I'll bounce back into balance. But um, yeah, um, I hope that that's kind of a roundabout way of answer. I hope that answered it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and where do you do it? And uh, with what kind of opponents, like these, uh, this kind of 
tactic. Yeah, like um, granted points by. Yeah, if they're, I mean, if they're a dangerous player, if they're a, a really dangerous player, I'll give them a little bit. I'll give them a little bit more space, and then we'll go into that jockey, that back and forth game. Um, but if they're a younger player, inexperienced, um, if I if I know that they're not quicker than me, um, then I'll just I'll get right into them. Okay, okay. that's great. And uh, in a, in a seven indoor side, right? You play seven aside. Uh, six, five, five field players and a goalie. Six. Do you do long passing too, or you try to? Play on the feet of a uh, combination of both. We try to we we try to build out of the back with feet, but if the other team is shifted up, or if they have a good press, um, the long ball to the corner off the corner boards and to our target, um, that's our ball to relieve pressure. Okay. So if we need to relieve the pressure, we'll we'll play that. We'll we'll hope that he gets it, which will cause their defense to collapse around him. And then he can kick it back to the defense. And now we have a lot more space to work with. Um, so it's, so it's a combination of both. And, and like I said, knowing when to use each Re reading the defense, reading the pressure, reading the balance and knowing what, you know, when to use a short pass versus a long pass. And you, you play in the highest level of indoor in the U S right? Correct. So at that level, when you do a passing, can you can you see where you are gonna pass? So it's kind of a no loop every time. Yeah. Um, there's a com there's both. I'd say there's a combination of each. Um, yes, I mean sometimes you like to try to throw the defense off and do the no look pass, but a lot of times it's just very simple. Just turn you know, your face where you're playing or pass pass where you're facing, uh, um, play the way you're facing. Yeah. Okay, uh, the top tip that maybe between you pro footballers have like uh, play where you face what are the other uh, like quotes that you use during the game like maybe um I, let's see definitely keep it simple okay. keep it simple is the biggest one um because that's you know uh, when people when players try to overcomplicate it that's when a lot of trouble happens uh keep it simple play the way you're facing um I'm blanking on them. I'm sure there's a couple more that would come up, but yeah, it's some okay. okay, no worries. And uh, I uh, what's the question that they are? Oh yeah, the one on one. I tend to sometimes train indi individually. How could you train the one on one defensively individually? I know it's kind of impossible, but do you have like any drills that you do? Maybe for um, I think like. Yes. So using the ladder to, to do your, to train footwork, because you have to be able to move backward very efficiently. And so taking a drill like the icky shuffle in a ladder, and instead of doing an icky shuffle forward, doing an icky shuffle backward, um, or jumping on one foot backward through the ladder. Um, I have a couple, yeah. So a couple, anything pretty much moving backward or sideways through the ladder, because that's going to train the, your body's coordination and it's going to help you develop balance moving backward, which is very, very, if you don't have balance moving backward, you're, you're screwed as a defender. Yeah. Um, so I use, I use a ladder a lot for those. And then I also use cones sometimes. So setting up like a slalom, like people would use to dribble through and then just shuffling backwards, side shuffling backwards, um, things like that. Mostly just training the footwork patterns and the movement. Ah, okay, I'll try it. I'll try it. So, and, and did you see any results on the pitch? Like when you do this exercise, you feel so much sharper and uh, comfortable. Yeah, I've, I've got the, the. I play with a couple. I've played with a couple of the best goalies in the league, and they always tell me that they, I, they don't understand how I move so well moving backwards. That I move better moving backwards than most players move going forward. And it just, and so the, the, I've, I've heard that from the last few goalies that I've played with. And I feel it. And so I'm glad that other people see it too. Um, and, and most of the guys know that I'm, the, you know, I've, I've, I've trained myself to be the fastest in the league and the best moving backward. And they, and they know it at this point. So. Okay. Do you have any videos about your, uh, your ladders, ladders moving backwards? On, on yeah. So I have, uh, I'm sure there are some on my page. Um, it's probably easier to find on, uh, or actually, no, there's definitely a lot on my page. If you go back a couple months, um, I have a lot there. I also have some, I do have a YouTube channel right now. It's not very big and I'm still in the process of putting videos on there, but that has a lot of my ladder exercises also. I can, I'll send that to you when we get done. Okay, thanks. 
because so I can have you like as a as a goal. Okay, I'm gonna do this as fast as Robert, so I can. Awesome, awesome. I love that. <laughs> well, honestly, honestly, you're an inspiration because um, I'm 22 and I'm trying so bad to be a professional here in UK. Even though I got to meet in UK, especially 11 aside, there is so much competition and the level is so high. I used to play when I was 18 in the fifth league in Italy. So when I came here, I was thinking, okay, if I can play in the fifth league in Italy, in England, I'm going to be like pro in a couple of years, max, maximum. Instead, I'm in the ninth division, which is still semi-pro, but it's the ninth division. So right. and have you ever tried to play 11 aside? Uh, I did. When I was back ages 21 to 24, most of the tryouts that I went through was all outside, outdoor, 11 aside. Um, but especially here, here in the U.S., it's not like uh, other countries where there's all those different divisions. There's, there's only three levels here in the U.S. There's the MLS, USL, and then the third one changes names every few years. Mm -hmm. They're really unorganized. Um, so it's really difficult. So the, the opportunity to play is not very high. Um, and so for me, in the, in the tryout, in one of the tryouts, I'm the, the coach also knew of an indoor team and was like, Hey, you should go try out for this indoor team. And that's, that's like what pushed me in that direction. I think if I hadn't, if I hadn't made it in an indoor, I would have, I would have probably uh, kept trying to play outdoor. Um, but yeah, so I, I tried and I just couldn't find the right opportunity. And um, even here, like there's, back then now there's a, a lot more mls teams but back then shoot 10 years ago 15 years ago there was only i think 12 12 or 13 mls teams and maybe maybe that many second division teams too and so it was just really really difficult to to find a spot oh wow wow because yeah it's so like uh, up until uh, two years ago it was really difficult to be a pro in u.s for instance, Matt Sheldon went to New Zealand because he didn't find a team in the U.S. as a pro. Now it's kind of easier because there is a USL2 and NISA, if it's correct, but still it's not easy. Yeah, no, yeah. It's a and challenge. I also saw, I, I discovered the indoor football uh, thanks to Michael Lewis Cunningham and uh, it's it's a show. I mean, there are fans, uh, cheerleader, music. It's amazing to play in those arena. I tell I tell people all the time because Americans don't really soccer is not very big in America yet. It's getting bigger, but still football, baseball, and basketball are, are bigger here. <clears throat> but I try to tell people that indoor soccer is soccer for Americans because Americans yeah. like to be. They like to be. I guess everyone across the world really. They like to, you like to be entertained and we like music and we like yeah. lights and we like, you know, girls dancing. Like, and so, yeah, that's, that's the cool thing about indoor soccer is it's, it's a full family production. They're trying to, they're trying to capture the kids' attention they're trying to capture the adults' attention and make it a full show and production. Um, so that's a very, very unique element of indoor soccer here. Yeah, honestly, I'm going to finish the uni year in two years. And uh, one of the ideas, even though it's difficult, is to try to try out in the indoor in the US, even though I know I'm um, European passport, it's difficult and stuff. But try in uh, entering in a team there, like even one year playing in those arena with those atmosphere. It's amazing. I, I think every time you start, uh, you start a game, you feel like, Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi playing Champions League final because you have so many, so many things like cheerleading music. There is even the mascot, right? Yeah, they got the mascots. Yep. <laughs> it's, crazy. it's crazy. So the best two advice that you receive, uh, you receive it in your career. What are they? And the worst one, the worst one too. <laughs> Uh, the best piece of advice, <clears throat> there was an agency that I worked with uh, a few years ago, about four or five years ago. And actually, I did play, I forgot, I did play 11 aside. I went to Sweden back in 2017, and I played in Sweden for about four months. Um, I played in the 
fourth division down there. And uh, the agency that took me out there, the the head coach or the the head guy, he's he was like the head coach, the director, everything. His name's Brett Hall. He's an incredible guy. Uh, he he used to always tell me, um, uh, what was his way of putting it? Do no, uh, do no harm, but take no shit. Do no harm, but take no shit. And it's don't go out like looking to be like for a defender, especially like don't go out like looking to be a bruiser, looking to be like a like a bully or intimidator, but be that guy that puts the foot down. If the other, if it's like somebody on the other team is, is playing reckless or hitting guys or whatever, then be that defender, take no shit, put your foot down and, you know, do what needs to be done. So do no harm, but take no shit. That's, that's one of my favorite ones. Um, and then I actually, when I got in, so the other one didn't even come from soccer players. It came from, I was in a gym and it's what got me into speed and agility and quickness was there was this football player that was always in, in the same gym as me. And so we just got to talk in and uh, one day and, and I, he, I saw him doing these crazy box jumps and I had never done box jumps before. And uh, so after a couple of weeks, he was like, you know, he, he had me, he invited me over to do, to do a workout with him and it was cool. And I couldn't even do half of the exercises cause I wasn't fast at that time. I couldn't jump. Like I, I'd never done that type of training. And he told me, he was like, look, man, if you're going to be, he's like, I don't know shit about soccer, but I know what it takes to be a professional athlete. Cause he was a professional arena football player. He's like, I know what it takes to be a professional athlete. And it takes a lot of hard work and in tr- this type of training to be a better, to be able to move better and be faster and be stronger. And, uh, so he was like, if you're going to be a professional athlete, you need to do this type of training as well. And that was probably the first shift for me to even start thinking about, oh, there is other things to train other than just training with a ball. I do need to train strength. I do need to train explosiveness. I do need to, you know, nutrition was the next thing that I started focusing on. Um, so it was that guy's advice to, to focus on that type of training also. That was very, very influential in my career. And how old were you when you started this kind of training? 22 okay yep yeah right around your age yeah it was uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh so that was good and that man changed my entire game i went from running a five uh i ran a five three 40 yard dash and okay. now i run about a four four 40 yard dash and so if, i know you said you look at like nfl numbers and stuff like generally the idea is to break a four five and so i broke a four four um, a couple of years ago. And that's pretty much my standard now. Uh, but yeah, just being able to move just that split. Cause you know, as a, as a soccer player, like it's, it's a game of, it's a, not even a game of seconds. It's a game of milliseconds, split seconds. So if you can have, if you can be a half a second quicker, um, it's going to make all the difference. So, so those are the two, like, like really good piece of advice to change my game. Um, and then the one bad piece of advice was just the, the, the one, you know, the one coach that told me to think about plan B and it was crazy how that, how like that came about. So I went to, I always had this thing with my coaches where I asked them for feedback um, every, every week, every couple of weeks. So, you know, Hey coach, what am I doing? Well, all right. Hey coach, what do I need to be working on? You know, where can I sharpen up this week? And it was the very first uh, time I went to him and I was like, Hey man, you know, I know you're a new coach for me. And so one of the things that I like to do is just get feedback. And so I'm, you know, I want to know, to, you know, based on the first, it was like three weeks into training. I was like, based on the first three weeks of training, what do you think that I need to work on? And what do you think that, uh, where do you think I can improve my game? And his direct response was, well, I think it's time for you to start thinking about plan B in life. And what else do you want to do outside of soccer? And I was like, That's not what I'm looking for, man. Like I, I got really upset in the moment, man. I think I cried on my way home to be honest, because I was super upset. Um, but you know, just that, that was definitely the worst, the worst piece of advice I got. <laughs> And how old were you when you got that advice? Uh, that was 20, more or less 23, 23, 24. Right, so, right before that, that was like a year before, that was like two years before I got my first contract. So okay, okay. like 23, 24. Yeah. Yeah. The last question, and then I'll let you go. Uh, the, the football in Sweden, did you find any differences between the US and Sweden? Because I know many people are saying, okay, yeah. Big time. Yeah, man. Uh, 
it's just crazy to me that people over in, in those in that country, or at least the players that I was with, even the least athletic players were better than a lot of American players because they know the game and they read the game so well. Like I had, a, there were a couple of guys on my team that they weren't very fast and they weren't very strong. Now, if they were fast and strong, they probably would have made it to the, the what is it? Super Spen League. Uh, Alvin yeah. Alvin yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but even so, they, they, you know, they weren't that, they didn't focus on that type of training. They weren't that fast, they weren't that strong, but man, they were so smart and they could make anything, they could make the ball go anywhere, do anything. Um, and so that was a big difference for me because, you know, American players, uh, that's just a different style. Like, If, if you're not athletic, like American players aren't that technical or that smart in the first place. And then if they're not athletic, then they're nowhere even close to that. And so that was, that was a big eye opener for me. It was like, man, these other people across the world just know the game different. And I started to think about why. And it's like, even for me as, as an athlete, like growing up, I played seven different sports. And so, and there was nothing wrong with that. And I'm grateful that my parents exposed me to a lot of different elements but it's not like in other countries where you just play soccer and you just, you know, it's soccer, 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 soccer. And that type of exposure for the brain and the body is just, it, it, it raises a totally different player than the American player who plays an hour of soccer and then an hour of base, ba basketball and then an hour of baseball um, and then does that every single week. You know, it's the thing about like from, from a young player standpoint, spending, Uh, let's say three hours a day, you know, let's say four hours a day, five days a week, 20 hours of soccer per week versus an American player, maybe one hour of soccer, three days a week. So you're looking at three hours of soccer versus 20 hours of soccer every single week growing up. Um, it's just a totally different breed of player. So, uh, and, and it's recognizable. Yeah, if I think about my career from five to 12, uh, if I wasn't in the team training, I was in my garden playing soccer with other kids, like hours and hours on end. But I'm thinking now that maybe it would have been better to diversify a little bit because I think if I did maybe basketball a bit or whatever, I would have had more, uh, more strength and more abilities physically. So, and I also saw a research uh, that early specialization is bad uh, in terms of injury prevention standpoint. In fact, um, if you think about Chinese, like Chinese with lifting, up until 18, 19, they are the best. And then no one heard about uh, Chinese uh, with lifters because then they get injured or something happened. I don't know. That's a yeah. very interesting perspective. And that's absolutely right. You're right about that. So that's a good perspective. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. So for many people, early specializ specialization is wrong, but maybe it's not too bad starting nine, nine sports when you were a child, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so Robert, it's been an hour. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, that's it. Good luck for yeah. the season. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I, I enjoyed speaking with you. And if I can do anything for you or any of your followers in the future, just let me know. Of course, of course. All right, Christian. Have a good morning. Uh, good. Have a great day. Yeah, you do. Thank God you. bless.